Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where it's time for another structure build. And very much like the general store we built last week, this is going to be a shallow relief structure up close to the backdrop. But this time, it's for the Wild West boomtown of Calico. And the structure I want to start on today is this one. Cordelia's Cafe, home of the best fried chicken and berry pies in all of Thunder Mesa country. Once again, I'm starting with a cardboard mock-up. This is one I made a couple of years ago to hold the space there in Calico Town. And uh, before you ask, no, this is not a structure from Knott's Berry Farm. So, you know, don't bother going to look for it. Uh, it also doesn't exist in the real town of Calico. This is a, uh, a totally made up design, one that I came up with to fit the available space. But I wanted to do something that was a, you know, a tribute to Cordelia Knott and her famous fried chicken dinners. Uh, so Cordelia's Cafe is what we have. It's pretty small. It's going to be even smaller when it's built up against the backdrop. And right now I need to take some measurements from it and uh, go into the computer and create a graphic for this front wall because the best way to model this, I think, is going to be using printed CG wood textures, a technique I've used very often in the past with some success for structures and rolling stock and things like that. Things that have, uh, you know, are kind of what I call graphics intense, have a lot of intricate signage on them uh, that would be really difficult to, to paint or stencil or do it any other way. So we're going to create a, a wooden look wall, a wall that looks like it's made of wood and painted blue with this signage on the front. And that will be the basis for the, uh, the entire structure. So let's get started on that. Our first stop is at a website called textures.com where you can sign up for free with your email and then get a limited number of free downloads. These files are primarily used by CG artists, but there's no rule that says we can't use them in our modeling, too. Over on the left, you'll find a list of categories, and today we want to scroll all the way down to the wood. Specifically, we're looking for some painted planks. As you can see, there's quite a selection. Let's see. Nope. Ah, there's a good one. Pretty close to the right color, too. When you find the file you want, click on the photo to see the sizes available. You'll want to download the highest resolution that you can. Just click the download button and then save the file somewhere you'll be able to find it later. Now we open up Adobe Photoshop, or your preferred photo editing program with similar capabilities, and create a new document that's at least 300 pixels per inch. That makes for higher quality printing. Here, I've imported at full size part of the Illustrator file created for the original structure mockup. To make the next job easier, I've broken it up into two layers, one that's just the shape of the false front at full size, and another that contains the sign. The bottom layer is just a plain white background. Then I like to save my file in a folder that will contain all of the model's digital assets. Next, we want to open up the CG wood texture that we recently downloaded. Select all, then copy and paste into our working document. This will create a new layer with just the wood textures. Now I want these boards to be horizontal, not vertical. So go on up to Edit, Transform, and then Rotate 90 degrees. The wood texture layer needs to be underneath the sign graphics and the wall shape. So I'll just grab that layer with my cursor and move it down. Now I want to resize the image so the boards are about six scale inches apart. So I'll just pull down a couple of guides from the ruler up at the top and position them one-eighth of an inch apart, or six O-scale inches. Then I'll use Edit, Free Transform to scale the image until the boards are the same width as the guides. A little fiddling may be required to get things lined up properly. Now I need to select the layer that just has the blue background shape, and we'll use the magic wand tool to select all of the area outside of it. Now going back to the wood texture layer, we hit clear. Moving the layer up, we now have a wood texture image that's the perfect shape and size. To adjust the color, I'll play around with the levels and hue saturation tools up in the image tab 
until I get the more faded look that I'm after. I decided to make some of the lettering pop a little more by adding a colored stroke or outline around them. One great thing about Adobe Photoshop is that there is almost no end to how you can continue to manipulate an image while it's still in separate layers. Of course, now the lettering looks a little too perfect and flat. One solution is to use the magic wand tool to select the letter shapes, then copy and paste them in place from down on the wood texture layer. Move this new layer up to the top, and then you can manipulate the color and transparency until it looks like the letters are actually painted on the wood. Another effective trick I like to use is to select the outer portion of the wall or sign with the lasso tool. Then feather the selection by a large amount, say 50 to 100 pixels. Then you can use the levels and hue saturation tools to darken this outer area just a bit. This is digital weathering. You can also add a drop shadow to your lettering. Just duplicate the lettering layer and go down to the bottom of the layers palette and click on the FX. Then you can add a color overlay. I chose a muted dark green. And then use the arrow keys on my keyboard to nudge the entire layer a few pixels to the right and a few pixels down. Just make sure the drop shadow layer is behind or below your lettering. To give a little Victorian flair, I chose some dingbats from one of my favorite western fonts, in this case Big Thunder, and then combined them with the line tool to make a couple of decorative flourishes. Then I used the rectangular selection tool to copy and paste a section of the wooden background below the famous fried chicken part of the sign. That made it easy to lighten and adjust the color to make it appear like this part of the wall had been painted a lighter shade. Another trick for making the letters look painted on is to add the gaps between the boards. To really make this work, you first need a shadow version of the lettering. Fortunately, that's pretty easy to do. You start by duplicating the lettering layer, and then use the Hue Saturation tool to darken it a few shades. The shadow layer gets moved behind your lettering. Then, with the lettering layer selected, Use the rectangular selection tool to create a long, skinny selection box that's at least as long as the wall, but just a couple of pixels high. This should be perfectly parallel to the gaps between the boards. Then you just move it down with the arrow keys and hit clear when it lines up with the gaps. This removes that small part of the lettering, but the shadow lettering down in the gap remains. The result can be very effective and realistic looking. Now we can merge those lettering layers together for the final step in the process. I like to use the eraser tool, set at about 100 pixels, but with an opacity setting of only about 15%, to go back over the lettering and fade it back here and there. Obviously, the older the sign, the more fading you're going to want. Since Cordelia's is in a boom town, I only want the fading and weathering to look a couple of years old. Once I'm happy with the wall, it's time to print. I like to flatten the layers and save everything in a new print file. Since I know I'll likely be needing more than one copy, I increase the canvas size and duplicate the graphic so I can print four on a single sheet of paper. My inkjet printer is nothing special. It's really all about using the right paper and the right print settings. I like to use this Epson Matte Premium presentation paper with the highest quality photo settings and inkjet paper selected on my printer. Then, you just cross your fingers and wait, and hope you don't run out of ink. And here is the result of all that digital magic. A printed paper front wall, which will hopefully fool the eye and look just like wood. Now, I realize it's virtually impossible to learn a complex program like Adobe Photoshop just from watching a single video like this. You really need to take a course in it. So if you're not familiar with the software, I apologize if I went a little fast through all of that. There are courses out there available from local community colleges. That's how I learned how to use it. And of course, there are all kinds of videos here on YouTube that will teach you how to use uh, photo editing software like Adobe Photoshop. But now, with all of that digital creation behind us, we can go ahead and jump into the actual model building. So the first thing I want to do with this is cut out one of these 
and then we're going to laminate it to a piece of this uh, Crescent 300 illustration board and that will bring it up to close to the thickness of a lot of the uh, wooden parts and pieces that I'm going to be using for the rest of the model. So I'll just take this over now. I'm going to spray the back side of it with some of this uh, 3M Super 77 adhesive. Get a nice even coat on there. And I'll just lay this on here. And then I like to use a, a brayer. This is used in printmaking. We pick these up at art supply retailers. And now we just cut this shape out. It's almost always better when making cuts like this to make uh, multiple shallow cuts than to try and do the whole thing at once. Now I could use this just like this and it would be okay. Um, it would probably work, but I wanted to go a little further in selling this illusion. I want this to look like clapboard. The boards overlap each other. And this is the reason why I did four of these printouts because I'm going to need two more to do the next step and of course the fourth one is just to have an extra just in case. So we want to cut out like two of these boards at a time. And I want to paint uh, any edges that are going to show. This bottom edge is going to show so I'm just using my watercolors um, create kind of a cool blue that matches that a little bit, or at least will look like a shadow down there. I'll paint a little diluted white glue on the back and glue that right over the board that's printed underneath. And the reason you need two of these printouts is because each one is going to overlap the one underneath by one board. So you alternate back and forth, cutting the strips from each one. So now this one will go on and overlap the one I just did by one board. And when I get a few of them on here, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now this is not a particularly uh, difficult technique. It's not that complicated. You just have to take great care to be sure that um, each strip lines up perfectly with the one below it. Of course, you can have some fun with it if you're modeling a, like an old abandoned building and you know have some of the claps uh, broken or peeling up, which is what I did uh, with this same technique on the newspaper office that I built for Gruesome Gulch. So there now you can really start to see that kind of uh, three-dimensional texture that that adds. And you just, you know, continue on um, alternating back and forth uh, between the two different printouts, uh, cutting out two boards at a time and overlapping them until you get to the top of the wall. And at the end, it's really easy to go back and just trim this uh, extra paper off the edge. And there is that finished clapboard wall. And it doesn't matter that the planks that we chose to use in the graphic were not clapboard originally. I just needed some painted planks. I can make them look like clapboard or board and batten or whatever I want uh, just by the way the model's put together. And speaking of that, that's what's next, putting the rest of the model together. But first, I want to get a clear acrylic spray on this, matte finish, uh, that'll protect it during the rest of the build. And for the rest of the building, I've created a slew of laser cut parts. I've got some um, 16th inch thick basswood parts for the main walls, uh, some 35 1 thousandth of an inch thick laser board pieces for all the trim and the doors and windows. Got some roof trusses, the back wall floor made out of some uh, 1 16th MDF. And you know, if you're uh, interested in this part of the process, I do have a video on this uh, using Adobe Illustrator to design structures for the laser cutter. Put a link to that and you can check that out. The first thing I want to do is uh, attach the back of the front wall. 
back of the front wall <laughs> to um, the part we just made. And this is just uh, cut out of some 1 16th inch basswood. So I'm going to stain this and glue it on there, and that'll bring the wall up to the proper thickness. For a stain, I'm going to use my uh, shoe dye and rubbing alcohol mixture. This is just some kiwi black. You empty all of it out into another container, and then you fill it up with 70% rubbing alcohol, shake it up, and so that residue mixes in with the alcohol and gives you a, just a near-perfect grayish wood stain. I made an interior floor, too. This is out of some just some 1 16th MDF. And I'm going to go ahead and stain this too. I'm using some Minwax Early American on here. And this is just for the parts of the interior that are visible through the windows. And while that stain is drying, I'm going to do a little work on these front and sidewall pieces while they're still flat. Got a couple of little decorative pieces of molding. I'm just looking at my uh, mock-up here to see, you know, for a little art direction, to see <laughs> what I decided, which parts will be, you know, the trim color and which parts will be the main structure color. So I'm going to glue those in so then I can paint all of these the same shade. Now these sidewalls are meant to be board and batten, so before I paint them I'm adding some O scale one by two battens, one at a time. Now I'll just spray these with a flat gray primer. Now I can glue the back of the false front to the front of the false front. Does that make sense? Lots of clamps, I think. Now I have to do something that's kind of tricky. I need to mix up a color that's as close to this blue on the printed paper as I can get it. I'm going to start with some apple barrel granite gray and then just add a drop, maybe two, of this uh, Vallejo blue. The Vallejo colors are really strong compared to these craft paints. So if you're mixing them together, you know, keep that in mind. Now that these are primed, I can just brush paint these walls. It's easy for acrylic paints to build up an obscure detail on something like this. They've got this scribed in detail, these boards that I don't want to hide. So you just got to make sure you keep it fairly thin. Always better to do a couple of thin coats than one thick one. Now I can start gluing these walls up. I'm going to start with the back wall and the right hand side. And then I'll just slide the floor in here. That'll help keep everything square as I go. Now for the front wall. I got this all together here and I was looking at it and the color is just not quite right. So now I'm going to go back over and dry brush with some white on here and try to match that look. Yeah, there we go. Now we're getting it. All right, now I got something that's much, much closer to the look of the print paper. And, you know, it's not perfect, but I think once everything put together with the trim and all that, it should look, it should look all right. Now I've got some interior walls that I cut from the same uh, Crescent illustration board. On the back of the false front, I've etched the outline of one of the roof trusses. And I'm going to go ahead and glue one of these on there. 
because that will help me when it comes time to position this on the front of the building. Help me get it in just the right spot. And also help to hold it on there. And I get some glue on this and on the bottom of these rafters. And I think we can uh, finish this front wall. That should just mate right down in there. Just like that. Now I'm getting ready to paint the windows and doors and the trim pieces. Some of these I'm building up a little bit. This is the outer trim. There's an inner piece too, and I'll show you that in a minute. Got this um, doing as much pre-assembly as I can before painting. Adding the uh, the corbels on here. So those go there, and then I've got some sixteenth of an inch thick. MDF that I cut these uh, little corbels out of. And those should slot right in to these openings like that. There we go. That's about ready to paint. There's still a couple other pieces that will go on to this um, after it's assembled on the front of the building. I've decided to use a two-tone color scheme on all of the trim, all the doors and windows. You can see the, uh, the inner layer is kind of a light tan, and then the outer trim is this nice warm ivory color, which uh, yeah, I can go ahead and start glazing these windows. Got some clear acetate that I've cut to size. And glue that on with some uh, this uh, good old Zap canopy glue. Great stuff for this. Drop this right on top. Now the casement gets glued on top. Get some glazing on the door. I want to add some blinds to the back of the door. This is just some manila file folder paper colored with a green sharpie. Just drop this into the opening. Nice fit. I'm applying some glue to the back of this bit of trim because it's time to start putting that on now. This is the uh, the inner piece of trim, which is the darker tan color. And this is going to help me position everything else. Get it in the right spot. Now this piece gets overlaid on top of that. A nice two-tone trim. I'm just about finished putting all the trim on. So now I've been working on the, uh, the windows, the interiors of the windows, adding some blinds. This is a look you often see in these old Victorian buildings is you've got a, uh, one of these pull-down blinds for the top half of the window. And then in the bottom half, you'll have drapes across like that. So kind of replicate that look there. And of course, once again, the blinds are made from some uh, manila file folder paper that I colored with a green Sharpie, just like I did on the door. And I've used the, once again, the old trick of um, crepe paper uh, for, the, uh, for the white drapes. And as I said earlier, there's really not gonna be a full interior in here as it's kind of back up against the backdrop. But I am going to add a figure. Uh, someone to represent Cordelia herself. This is a figure from a set of uh, Christmas carolers. But she's in just about perfect uh, Victorian era garb. So I'm going to put her in here where you can see her through the window. Now I can glue in the uh, rest of the roof trusses down in their little slots. Over on this side I trimmed one of the rafters short and that's because of what I'm going to add next.
I thought what this structure really needed was a uh, big stone fireplace, the stone chimney. I wanted something that looked like it was made out of the local sandstone. So I carved this out of some uh, polyurethane foam and I just finished painting it with acrylics. And the mortar between the stones is uh, spackle, spackling compound. A bit of a challenge to get it shaped just right to fit on the side of the building, but uh, really no problem. And now I can glue it into place. I want something that's going to fill the gaps. So I'm using some acrylic modeling paste. So when I press it into place, It'll look like the mortar is uh, blending into the side of the building. Just like so now I can glue these uh, roof panels onto the rafters, and these I cut from some uh, some chipboard. Before I start to shingle the roof, I want to add some flashing around the chimney here. So I've cut some manila file folder paper to size, six inches by six inches with a score down the middle so I can bend it. I'm just going to paint this copper. So when it's glued in, it'll look like copper flashing. So we get a piece here one on this side. One up top. A really nice detail to add is to uh, take some thick black acrylic paint and just go along the edge of this so it looks like tar where the uh, flashing meets the uh, stone chimney. And now for the shingles. And this is the last of my personal stash of uh, Crescent Creek Models real cedar shingles. This is all I got left. It should be just enough. When these are gone, I'll, I guess I'll need to cut some more. Calico is a boom town, so everything is fairly new. So I just did some light weathering on the shingles, did a, you know, kind of a light stain. Now I can finish off the top of this arch. And for that I have a piece of Bristol board, which is easy to curve. And I've painted it the trim color. Now I just need to uh, very carefully glue it into place. I'm going to have to clamp that with my fingers just like that for a few minutes. On the original mock-up, I added a, a canvas awning, and I really like that detail, so I wanted to replicate it on the model. So I used the same uh, file and cut a piece out of some uh, 15 thou polyback. I just need to fold that and glue it up. And I think I'll paint it a nice hunter green. It also seemed to me that a structure like this would have some decorative gingerbread up along the top of the roof. So while the paint is drying on that awning, I'll go ahead and add that. Let's see. This right there. Just like that. I also want to add some lighting, of course. And since this structure is going to be like right up against the backdrop, that's relatively easy. I've got a hole in the back and a three millimeter yellow LED, which could, should give us a nice warm glow from the interior. I'll just use some black gaffer's tape on the back to hold it in place. Now I can carefully Glue this into place. I want it right below that center molding. Yeah, just a little touch up here and there. Get that antique white. I'm going to do a little light weathering, just mostly 
on the roof. Add a little bit of age to that uh, that gingerbread up there too. And then around this copper flashing, I'm going to have some green vertigrase weathering. And that copper has been oxidized. And that'll bleed right onto the roof. And finally, some black soot all on this chimney here. <laughs> a lot of chicken dinners, a lot of boysenberry pies. And speaking of boysenberry pies, I just got to put one here cooling in the window. And this is something I carved out of uh, that urethane foam the same time I was carving the chimney. Just one little boysenberry pie cooling in the window. Just feed the wires down here behind the scene. I built this big front deck out here and eventually I want to have a whole little scene with some tables and chairs and checkered tablecloths, all that. But that's going to have to wait for a future episode of Calico Boomtown. For now, let's see how Cordelia's Cafe looks at nighttime. That's going to do it for the build of Cordelia's Cafe. I want to thank you all so much for watching and following along. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell if you would like to see more from Thunder Mesa Studio. And of course, you can always follow along on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see all that's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really like what we're doing here at the channel and want to show your support, you can do what these nice folks did and head on over to patreon.com slash Thunder Mesa and show your support there. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.